Hilary of Poitiers on the Trinity, Book 7. This is the seventh book of our treatise against the wild extravagance of modern heresy. In order of place, it must follow its predecessors. In order of importance, as an exposition of the mysteries of the right faith, it precedes and excels them all. I am well aware how hard and steep is the path of evangelical instruction up which we are mounting. The fears inspired by consciousness of my own incapacity are plucking me back, but the warmth of faith urges me on. The assaults of heresy heat my blood, and the dangers of the ignorant excite my compassion. I fear to speak, and yet I cannot be silent. A double dread subdues my spirit. It may be that speech, it may be that silence, will render me guilty of a desertion of the truth. For this cunning heresy has hedged itself round with marvelous devices of perverted ingenuity. First, there is the semblance of devotion. Then, the language carefully chosen to lull the suspicions of a candid listener. And again, the accommodation of their views to secular philosophy. And finally, their withdrawing of attention from manifest truth by a pretended explanation of divine methods. Their loud profession of the unity of God is a fraudulent imitation of the faith. Their assertion that Christ is the Son of God, a play upon words for the delusion of their hearers. Their saying that he did not exist before he was born, a bid for the support of the world's philosophers. Their confession of God as incorporeal and immutable leads by a display of fallacious logic, up to a denial of the birth of God from God. They turn our arguments against ourselves. The church's faith is made the engine of its own destruction. They have contrived to involve us in the perplexing position of an equal danger, whether we reason with them or whether we refrain. For they use the fact that we allow certain of their assumptions to pass unchallenged as an argument on behalf of those which we do contradict. We call to mind that in the preceding books the reader has been urged to study the whole of that blasphemous manifesto and mark how it is animated throughout by the one aim of propagating the belief that our Lord Jesus Christ is neither God nor Son of God. Its authors argue that he is permitted to use the names of God and of Son by virtue of a certain adoption, though neither Godhead nor Sonship be his by nature. They use the fact, true in itself, that God is immutable and incorporeal, as an argument against the birth of the Son from him. They value the truth that God the Father is one, only as a weapon against our faith in the Godhead of Christ, pleading that an incorporeal nature cannot be rationally conceived as generating another, and that our faith in one God is inconsistent with the confession of God from God. But our earlier books have already refuted and foiled this argument of theirs by an appeal to the law and the prophets. Our defense has followed step by step the course of their attack. We have set forth God from God and at the same time confessed one true God, showing that this presentation of the faith neither falls short of truth by ascribing singleness of person to the one true God, nor adds to the faith by asserting the existence of a second deity. 
For we confess neither an isolated God, nor yet two gods. Thus, neither denying that God is one, nor maintaining that he is alone, we hold the straight road of truth. Each divine person is in the unity, yet no person is the one God. Next, our purpose being to demonstrate the irrefragable truth of this mystery by the evidence of the evangelists and the apostles, our first duty has been to make our readers acquainted with the nature truly subsisting and truly born of the Son of God, to demonstrate that he has no origin external to God, and was not created out of nothing, but is the Son, born from God. This is a truth which the evidence adduced in the last book has placed beyond all doubt. The assertion that he bears the name of Son by virtue of adoption has been put to silence, and he stands forth as a true son by a true birth. Our present task is to prove from the Gospels that because he is true son, he is true God also. For unless he be true son, he cannot be true God, nor true God unless he be true son. Nothing is more harassing to human nature than the sense of impending danger. If calamities unknown or unanticipated befall us, we may need pity, yet we have been free from care. No load of anxiety has oppressed us, but he whose mind is full of possibilities of trouble suffers already a torment in his fear. I who now am venturing out to sea am a mariner not unused to shipwreck, a traveler who knows by experience holy brigands lurk in the forests, an explorer of African deserts aware of the danger from scorpions and asps and basilisks. I enjoy no instant of relief from the knowledge and fear of present danger. Every heretic is on the watch, noting every word as it drops from my mouth. The whole progress of my argument is infested with ambuscades and pitfalls and snares. It is not of the road, or its hardness or steepness, that I complain. I am following in the footsteps of the apostles, not choosing my own path. My trouble is the constant peril, the constant dread, of wandering into some ambush, of stumbling into some pit, of being entangled in some net. My purpose is to proclaim the unity of God in the sense of the law and the prophets and apostles. Sibelius is at hand, eager with cruel kindness to welcome me on the strength of this unity and swallow me up in his own destruction. If I withstand him and deny that in the Sibelian sense, God is one, a fresh heresy is ready to receive me, pointing out that I teach the existence of two gods. Again, if I undertake to tell how the Son of God was born from Mary, Photinus, the Ebion of our day, will be prompt to twist this assertion of the truth into a confirmation of his lie. I need mention no other heresies save one. All the world knows that they are alien from the church. It is one that has been often denounced, often rejected, yet it preys upon our vitals still. Galatia has reared a large brood of godless asserters of the unity of God. Alexandria has sown broadcast over almost the whole world her denial, which is an affirmation of the doctrine of two gods. Pannonia upholds her pestilent doctrine that the only birth of Jesus Christ was from the Virgin. 
and the church, distracted by these rival faiths, is in danger of being led by means of truth into a rejection of truth. Doctrines are being forced upon her for godless ends, which according to the use that is made of them will either support or overthrow the faith. For instance, we cannot, as true believers, assert that God is one if we mean it that he is alone. For faith in a lonely God denies the Godhead of the Son. If, on the other hand, we assert, as we truly can, that the Son is God, we are in danger, so they fondly imagine, of discerning the truth that God is one. We are in peril on either hand. We may deny the unity, or we may maintain the isolation, but it is a danger which has no terrors for the foolish things of the world. Our adversaries are blind to the fact that his assertion that he is not alone is consistent with unity, that though he is one, he is not solitary. But I trust that the church, by the light of her doctrine, will so enlighten the world's vain wisdom that even though it accept not the mystery of the faith, it will recognize that in our conflict with heretics, we, and not they, are the true representatives of that mystery. For great is the force of truth. Not only is it its own sufficient witness, but the more it is assailed, the more evident it becomes. The daily shocks which it receives only increase its inherent stability. It is the peculiar property of the church that when she is buffeted, she is triumphant. When she is assaulted with argument, she proves herself in the right. When she is deserted by her supporters, she holds the field. It is her wish that all men should remain at her side and in her bosom. If it lay with her, none would become unworthy to abide under the shelter of that august mother. None would be cast out or suffered to depart from her calm retreat. But when heretics desert her, or she expels them, the loss she endures, in that she cannot save them, is compensated by an increased assurance that she alone can offer bliss. This is a truth which the passionate zeal of rival heresies bring into the clearest prominence. The church, ordained by the Lord and established by his apostles, is one for all. But the frantic folly of discordant sects has severed them from her, and it is obvious that these dissensions concerning the faith result from a distorted mind which twists the words of Scripture into conformity with its opinion instead of adjusting that opinion to the words of Scripture. And thus, amid the clash of mutually destructive errors, the Church stands revealed not only by her own teaching, but by that of her rivals. They are ranged, all of them, against her, and the very fact that she stands single and alone is her sufficient answer to their godless delusions. The host of heresy assemble themselves against her. Each of them can defeat all the others, but not one can win a victory for itself. The only victory is the triumph which this church celebrates over them all. Each heresy wields against its adversary some weapon already shattered in another instance by the church's condemnation. There is no point of union between them, and the outcome of their internecine struggle is the confirmation of the faith. Sibelius sweeps away the birth of the Son, and then preaches the unity of God, but he does not doubt that the mighty nature which acted in the human Christ was God. He shuts his eyes to the revealed mystery of the sonship. The works done seem to him so marvelous 
that he cannot believe that he who performed them could undergo a true generation. When he hears the words, He that has seen me has seen the Father also, he jumps to the blasphemous conclusion of an inseparable and indistinguishable identity of nature in Father and Son, because he fails to see that the revelation of the birth is the mode in which their unity of nature is manifested to us. For the fact that the Father is seen in the Son is a proof of the Son's divinity, not a disproof of his birth. Thus, our knowledge of each of them is conditioned by our knowledge of the other, for there is no difference of nature between them, and since in this respect they are one, a reverent study of the character of either will give us a true insight into the nature of both. For indeed, it is certain that he, who was in the form of God, must in his self-revelation present himself to us in the exact aspect of the form of God. Again, this perverse and insane delusion derives a further encouragement from the words, I and the Father are one. From the fact of unity in the same nature, they have impiously deduced a confusion of persons. Their interpretation, that the words signify a single power, contradicts the tenor of the passage. For I and the Father are one does not indicate a solitary God. The use of the conjunction and shows clearly that more than one person is signified, and R requires a plurality of subject. Moreover, the one is not incompatible with a birth. Its sense is that the two persons have the one nature in common. The one is inconsistent with difference, the R with identity. Set our modern heresy in array against the delusion equally wild of Sibelius. Let them make the best of their case. The new heretics will advance the passage, The Father is greater than I, neglecting the mystery of the divine birth and the mystery of God's emptying himself and taking flesh. They will argue the inferiority of his nature from his assertion that the Father is the greater. They will plead against Sibelius that Christ is a son, and so far as one can be a son, who is inferior to the Father and needs to ask for restoration to his glory and fears to die, and indeed did die. In reply, Sibelius will adduce his deeds in evidence of his divine nature, and while our novel heresy to escape the admission of Christ's true sonship will heartily agree with him that God is one. Sibelius will emphatically assert the same article of the faith in the sense that no son exists. The one side lays stress upon the action of the son, the other urges that in that action God is manifest. The one will demonstrate the unity, the other disprove the identity. Sibelius will defend his position thus. The works that were done could even have been done by no other nature than the divine. Sons were remitted, the sick were healed, the lame ran, the blind saw, the dead lived. God alone has power for this. The words I and the Father are one could only have been spoken from self-knowledge. No nature outside the Father's could have uttered them. Why then suggest a second substance and urge me to believe in a second God? These works are peculiar to God. The one God wrought them. His adversaries, animated by a hatred equally venomous for the faith, will argue that the Son is unlike in nature to God the Father. You are ignorant of the mystery of your salvation. You must believe in a Son through whom the worlds were made, through whom man was fashioned, who gave the law through angels, who was born of Mary, who was sent by the Father, was crucified, dead and buried, 
who rose again from the dead and is at the right hand of God, who is the judge of quick and dead. Unto him we must rise again, we must confess him, we must earn our place in his kingdom. <laughs> Each of the two enemies of the church is fighting the church's battle. Sibelius displays Christ as God by the witness of the divine nature manifested in his works. Sibelius' antagonists confess Christ on the evidence of the revealed faith to be the Son of God. Again, how glorious a victory for our faith is that in which Ebion, in other words, Photinus, both wins the day and loses it. He castigates Sibelius for denying that the Son of God is man, and in his turn has to submit to the reproaches of Arian fanatics for failing to see that this man is the Son of God. Against Sibelius, he calls the Gospels to his aid, with their evidence concerning the Son of Mary. Arius deprives him of this ally by proving that the Gospels make Christ something more than the Son of Mary. Sibelius denies that there is a Son of God. Against him, Photinus elevates man to the place of son. Photinus will hear nothing of a son born before the worlds. Against him, Arius denies that the only birth of the Son of God was his human birth. Let them defeat one another to their heart's content, for every victory which each of them wins is balanced by a defeat. Our present adversaries are ranted in the matter of the divine nature of the Son, Sibelius in the matter of the Son's revealed existence. Photinus is convicted of ignorance, or else of falsehood, in his denial of the Son's birth before the worlds. Meanwhile, the Church, whose faith is based upon the teaching of evangelists and apostles, holds fast against Sibelius, her assertion that the Son exists against Arius, that he is God by nature, against Photinus, that he created the universe. And she is the more convinced of her faith, in that they cannot combine to contradict it, for Sibelius points to the works of Christ in proof of the divinity of him who wrought them, though he knows not that the Son was their author. The Arians grant him the name of Son, though they confess not that the true nature of God dwelt in him. Photinus maintains his manhood, though in maintaining it he forgets that Christ was born as God before the worlds. Thus, in their several assertions and denials, there are points in which each heresy is in the right in defense or attack, and the result of their conflicts is that the truth of our confession is brought into clearer light. I felt that I must spare a little space to point this out. It has been from no love for amplification, but that it might serve as a warning. First, I wished to expose the vague and confused character of this crowd of heresies, whose mutual feuds turn, as we have seen, to our advantage. Secondly, in my warfare against the blasphemous doctrines of modern heresy, that is, in my task of proclaiming that both God the Father and God the Son are God, in other words, that Father and Son are one in name, one in nature, one in the kind of divinity which they possess, I wished to shield myself from any charge which might be brought against me, either as an advocate of two gods, or of one lonely and isolated deity. For in God the Father and God the Son, as I have set them forth, no confusion of persons can be detected, nor in my exposition of their common nature can any difference between the Godhead of the one and of the other be discerned. In the preceding book I have sufficiently refuted by the witness of the Gospels those who deny the subsistence of God the Son by a true birth from God. 
my present duty is to show that he who in the truth of his nature is son of God is also in the truth of his nature God but this proof must not degenerate into the fatal profession of a solitary God or of a second God it shall manifest God as one yet not alone but in its care to avoid the error of making him lonely it shall not fall into the error of denying his unity thus we have all these different assurances of the divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ his name his birth his nature his power his own assertion as to the name I conceive that no doubt is possible it is written in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God what reason can there be for suspecting that he is not what his name indicates and does not this name clearly describe his nature if a statement be contradicted it must be for some reason what reason I demand is there in this instance for denying that he is God the name is given him plainly and distinctly and unqualified by any incongruous addition which might raise a doubt the word we read which was made flesh was none other than God here is no loophole for any such conjecture as that he has received this name as a favor or taken it upon himself so possessing a titular Godhead which is not his by nature consider the other recorded instances in which this name was given by favor or assumed to Moses it was said I have made you a God to Pharaoh does not this addition to Pharaoh account for the title did God impart to Moses the divine nature did he not rather make Moses a God in the sight of Pharaoh who was to be smitten with terror when Moses's serpent swallowed the magic serpents and returned into a rod when he drove back the venomous flies which he had called forth when he stayed the hail by the same power wherewith he had summoned it and made the locusts depart by the same might which had brought them when in the wonders that he wrought the magicians saw the finger of God that was the sense in which Moses was appointed to be God to Pharaoh he was feared and entreated he chastised and healed it is one thing to be appointed a God it is another thing to be God he was made a God to Pharaoh he had not that nature and that name wherein God consists I call to mind another instance of the name being given as a title that where it is written I have said you are gods but this is obviously the granting of a favor I have said proves that it is no definition but only a description by one who chooses to speak thus a definition gives us knowledge of the object defined a description depends on the arbitrary will of the speaker when a speaker is manifestly conferring a title that title has its origin only in the speaker's words not in the thing itself the title is not the name which expresses its nature and kind but in this case the word in very truth is God the essence of the Godhead exists in the word and that essence is expressed in the words name for the name word is inherent in the Son of God as a consequence of his mysterious birth as are also the names wisdom and power these together with the substance which is his by a true birth were called into existence to be the Son of God yet since they are the elements of God's nature they are still imminent in him in undiminished extent although they were born from him to be his son for 
As we have said so often, the mystery which we preach is that of a son who owes his existence not to division, but to birth. He is not a segment cut off, and so incomplete, but an offspring born, and therefore perfect. For birth involves no diminution of the begetter, and has the possibility of perfection for the begotten. And therefore, the titles of those substantive properties are applied to God the only begotten. For when he came into existence by birth, it was they which constituted his perfection. And this, although they did not thereby desert the Father, in whom, by the immutability of his nature, they are eternally present, for instance, the Word is God, the only begotten, and yet the unbegotten Father is never without his Word. Not that the nature of the Son is that of a sound which is uttered. He is God from God, subsisting through a true birth. God's own Son, born from the Father, indistinguishable from him in nature, and therefore inseparable. This is the lesson which his title of the word is meant to teach us. And in the same way, Christ is the wisdom and the power of God. Not that he is, as he is often regarded, the inward activity of the Father's might or thought, but that his nature, possessing through birth, a true substantial existence is indicated by these names of inward forces. For an object which has by birth an existence of its own cannot be regarded as a property. A property is necessarily inherent in some being and can have no independent existence. But it was to save us from concluding that the sun is alien from the divine nature of his Father, that he, the only begotten from the eternal God his Father, born as God into a substantial existence of his own, has had himself revealed to us under these names of properties, of which the Father, out of whom he came into existence, has suffered no diminution. Thus he, being God, is nothing else than God. And when I hear the words, and the word was God, they do not merely tell me that the Son was called God, they reveal to my understanding that he is God. In those previous instances where Moses was called God and others were styled gods, there was the mere addition of a name by way of title. Here a solid essential truth is stated, the word was God. That was indicates no accidental title, but an eternal reality, a permanent element of his existence, an inherent character of his nature. And now let us see whether the confession of Thomas the Apostle, when he cried, My Lord and my God, corresponds with this assertion of the evangelist. We see that he speaks of him, whom he confesses to be God as my God. Now Thomas was undoubtedly familiar with these words of the Lord, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. How then could the faith of an apostle become so oblivious of that primary command as to confess Christ as God, when life is conditional upon the confession of the divine unity? It was because... In the light of the resurrection, the whole mystery of the faith had become visible to the apostle. He had often heard such words as, I and the Father are one, and all things that the Father has are mine, and I in the Father and the Father in me. And now he can confess that the name of God expresses the nature of Christ without peril to the faith, without breach of loyalty to the one God, 
the Father, his devotion could now regard the Son of God as God, since he believed that everything contained in the nature of the Son was truly of the same nature with the Father. No longer need he fear that such a confession as his was the proclamation of a second God, a treason against the unity of the divine nature, for it was not a second God whom that perfect birth of the Godhead had brought into being. Thus it was with full knowledge of the mystery of the gospel that Thomas confessed his Lord and his God. It was not a title of honor, it was a confession of nature. He believed that Christ was God in substance and in power, and the Lord in turn shows that this act of worship was the expression not of mere reverence, but of faith. When he says, Because you have seen, you have believed. Blessed are they which have not seen and have believed. For Thomas had seen before he believed. But you ask, what was it that Thomas believed? That beyond a doubt which is expressed in his words, My Lord and my God. No nature but that of God could have risen by its own might from death to life. And it is this fact that Christ is God, which was confessed by Thomas with the confidence of an assured faith. Shall we then dream that his name of God is not a substantial reality when that name has been proclaimed by a faith based upon certain evidence? Surely a son devoted to his father, one who did not his own will, but the will of him that sent him, who sought not his own glory, but the glory of him from whom he came, would have rejected the adoration involved in such a name as destructive of that unity of God which had been the burden of his teaching. Yet in fact he confirms this assertion of the mysterious truth made by the believing apostle. He accepts as his own the name which belongs to the nature of the Father. And he teaches that they are blessed who, though they have not seen him rise from the dead, yet have believed on the assurance of the resurrection that he is God. Thus, the name which expresses his nature proves the truth of our confession of the faith, for the name which indicates any single substance points out also any other substance of the same kind, and in this instance there are not two substances but one substance, of the one kind. For the Son of God is God. This is the truth expressed in his name. The one name does not embrace two gods, for the one name, God, is the name of one indivisible nature. For since the Father is God and the Son is God, that name which is peculiar to the divine nature is inherent in each. Therefore, the two are one. For the Son, though he subsists through a birth from the divine nature, yet preserves the unity in his name, and this birth of the Son does not compel loyal believers to acknowledge two gods, since our confession declares that Father and Son are one both in nature and in name. Thus the Son of God has the divine name as the result of his birth. Now the second step in our demonstration was to be that of showing that it is by virtue of his birth that he is God. I have still to bring forward the evidence of the apostles that the divine name is used of him in an exact sense, but for the present I purpose to continue our enquiry into the language of the Gospels. And first I ask, what new element destructive of his Godhead, can have been imported by birth into the nature of the Son. Universal reason rejects the supposition that a being can become different in nature by the process of birth from the being to which its birth is due. Although we recognize the possibility that from parents 
different in kind, an offspring sharing the nature of both, yet diverse from either, may be propagated. The fact is familiar in the case of beasts, both tame and wild, but even in this case there is no real novelty. The new qualities already exist, concealed in the two different parental natures, and are only developed by the connection. The birth of their joint offspring is not the cause of that offspring's difference from its parents. The difference is a gift from them of various diversities which are received and combined in one frame. When this is the case, as to the transmission and reception even of bodily differences, is it not a form of madness to assert that the birth of God, the only begotten, was the birth from God of a nature inferior to himself? For the giving of birth is a function of the true nature of the transmitter of life, and without the presence and action of that true nature, there can be no birth. The object of all this heat and passion is to prove that there was no birth but a creation of the Son of God, that the divine nature is not his origin, and that he does not possess that nature in his personal subsistence, but draws from what was non-existent, a nature different in kind from the divine. They are angry, because he says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. For since God is a spirit, it is clear that in one born from him there can be nothing alien or different from that spirit from which he was born. Thus, the birth of God constitutes him perfect God, and hence also it is clear that we must not say that he began to exist, but only that he was born. For there is a sense in which beginning is different from birth. A thing which begins to exist either comes into existence out of nothing or develops out of one state into another, ceasing to be what it was before. So, for instance, gold is formed out of earth, solids melt into liquids, cold changes to warmth, white to red, water breeds moving creatures, lifeless objects turn into living. In contrast to all this, the Son of God did not begin out of nothing to be God, but was born as God, nor had he an existence of another kind before the divine. Thus he who was born to be God had neither a beginning of his Godhead, nor yet a development up to it. His birth retained for him that nature out of which he came into being. The Son of God, in his distinct existence, is what God is, and is nothing else. Again, anyone who is in doubt concerning this matter may gain from the Jews an accurate knowledge of Christ's nature, or rather learn that he was truly born from the gospel, where it was written, Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he not only broke the Sabbath, but said also that God was his own father, making himself equal with God. This passage is unlike most others in not giving us the words spoken by the Jews, but the apostles' explanation of their motive in wishing to kill the Lord. We see that no plea of misapprehension can excuse the wickedness of these blasphemers, for we have the apostles' evidence that the true nature of Christ was fully revealed to them, they could speak of his birth. He said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Was not his clearly a birth of nature from nature, when he published the equality of his nature by speaking of God by name as his own father? Now, it is manifest that Equality consists in the absence of difference between those who are equal. Is it not also manifest that the result of birth must be a nature in which there is an absence of difference between son and father? And this 
is the only possible origin of true equality. Birth can only bring into existence a nature equal to its origin. But again, we can no more hold that there is equality where there is confusion than we can where there is difference. Thus, equality, as of the image, is incompatible with isolation and with diversity, for equality cannot dwell with difference, nor yet in solitude. And now, although we have found the sense of scripture, as we understand it in harmony with the conclusions of ordinary reason, the two agreeing that equality is incompatible either with diversity or with isolation, yet we must seek a fresh support for our contention from actual words of our Lord. For so we can check that license of arbitrary interpretation whereby these bold traducers of the faith would even venture to cavil at the Lord's solemn self-revelation. His answer to the Jews was this, The Son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the Father do. For whatever things he does, these also does the Son likewise. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that himself does. And he will show him greater works than these, that you may marvel. For as the Father raises up the dead and quickens them, even so the Son quickens whom he will. For the Father judges no man, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He that honors not the Son, honors not the Father which has sent him. The course of our argument, as I have shaped it in my mind, required that each several point of the debate should be handled singly, that since we had been taught that our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is God in name, in birth, in nature, in power, in self-revelation, our demonstration of the faith should establish each successive point in that order. But his birth is a barrier to such a treatment of the question. For a consideration of it includes a consideration of his name and nature and power and self-revelation. For his birth involves all these, and they are his by the fact that he is born. And thus our argument concerning his birth has taken such a course that it is impossible for us to keep these other matters back for separate discussion in their turn. The chief reason why the Jews wished to kill the Lord was that in calling God his Father, he had made himself equal with God, and therefore he put his answer in which he reproved their evil passion into the form of an exposition of the whole mystery of our faith. For just before this, when he had healed the paralytic and they had passed their judgment upon him that he was worthy of death for breaking the Sabbath, he had said, My Father works hitherto, and I work. Their jealousy had been inflamed to the utmost by the raising of himself to the level of God which was involved in this use of the name of Father. And now he wishes to assert his birth and to reveal the powers of his nature. And so he says, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the Father do. These opening words of his reply are aimed at that wicked zeal of the Jews which hurried them on even to the desire of slaying him. It is in reference to the charge of breaking the Sabbath that he says, My father works hitherto, and I work. He wished them to understand that his practice was justified by divine authority, and he taught them by the same words that his work must be regarded as the work of the Father, who was working in him all that he wrought. And again, it was to subdue the jealousy awakened by his speaking of God as his Father, that he uttered those words, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the Father do. Lest this making of himself equal to God as having the name and nature of God's Son 
should withdraw men's faith from the truth that he had been born? He says that the son can do nothing but what he sees the father do. Next, in confirmation of the saving harmony of truths in our confession of father and of son, he displays this nature which is his by birth, a nature which derives its power of action not from successive gifts of strength to do particular deeds, but from knowledge. He shows that his knowledge is not imparted by the Father's performance of any bodily work as a pattern that the Son may imitate what the Father has previously done, but that by the action of the divine nature he had come to share the subsistence of the divine nature, or, in other words, had been born as son from the Father. He told them that, because the powers and nature of God dwelt consciously within him, it was impossible for him to do anything which he had not seen the Father doing, that since it is in the might of the Father that God the only begotten performs his works, his liberty of action coincides in its range with his knowledge of the powers of the nature of God the Father, a nature inseparable from himself and lawfully owned by him in virtue of his birth. For God sees not after a bodily fashion, but possesses by his nature the vision of omnipotence. The next words are, for whatever things he, the Father, does, these also does the Son likewise. This likewise is added to indicate his birth, whatsoever and same to indicate the true divinity of his nature, whatsoever and same make it impossible that there should be any actions of his that are different from or outside the actions of the Father. Thus he, whose nature has power to do all the same things as the Father, is included in the same nature with the Father. But when, in contrast with this, we read that all these same things are done by the Son likewise, the fact that the works are like those of another is fatal to the supposition that he who does them works in isolation. Thus the same things that the Father does are all done likewise by the Son. Here we have clear proof of his true birth, and at the same time a convincing attestation of the mystery of our faith, which with its foundation in the unity of the nature of God, confesses that there resides in Father and Son an indivisible divinity. For the Son does the same things as the Father, and does them likewise, while acting in like manner he does the same things. Two truths are combined in one proposition. That his works are done likewise proves his birth. That they are the same works proves his nature. Thus the progressive revelation contained in our Lord's reply is at one with the progressive statement of truth in the Church's confession of faith. Neither of them divides the nature, and both declare the birth. For the next words of Christ are, For the Father loves the Son, and shows him all things that himself does, and he will show him greater works than these, that you may marvel. For as the Father raises up the dead and quickens them, even so the Son quickens whom he will. Can there be any other purpose in this revelation of the manner in which God works, except that of inculcating the true birth? The faith in a subsisting Son, born from the subsisting God his Father? The only other explanation is that God the Only Begotten, was so ignorant that he needed the instruction conveyed in this showing. But the reckless blasphemy of the suggestion makes this alternative impossible. For he, knowing as he does, everything that he is taught, has no need of the teaching. 
And accordingly, after the words, the Father loves the Son, and shows him all things that himself does, we are next informed that all this showing is for our instruction in the faith, that the Father and the Son may have their equal share in our confession, and we be saved by this statement that the Father shows all that he does to the Son from the delusion that the Son's knowledge is imperfect. With this object, he goes on to say, And he will show him greater works than these, that you may marvel. For as the Father raises up the dead and quickens them, even so the Son quickens whom he will. We see that the Son has full knowledge of the future works which the Father will show him hereafter. He knows that he will be shown how, after his Father's example, he is to give life to the dead, for he says that the Father will show to the Son things at which they shall marvel, and at once proceeds to tell them what these things are. For as the Father raises up the dead and quickens them, even so the Son quickens whom he will. The power is equal because the nature is one and the same. The showing of the works is an aid not to ignorance in him, but to faith in us. It conveys to the Son no knowledge of things unknown, but it imparts to us the confidence to proclaim his birth by assuring us that the Father has shown to him all the works that he himself can do. The terms used in this divine discourse have been chosen with the utmost deliberation, lest any vagueness of language should suggest a difference of nature between the two. Christ says that the Father's works were shown him, instead of saying that, to enable him to perform them, a mighty nature was given him. Hereby, he wishes to reveal to us that this showing was a substantive part of the process of his birth, since simultaneously with that birth, there was imparted to him by the Father's love a knowledge of the works which the Father willed that he should do, and again, to save us from being led by this declaration of the showing to suppose that the Son's nature is ignorant and therefore different from the Father's, he makes it clear that he already knows the things that are to be shown him. So far indeed is he from needing the authority of precedent to enable him to act, that he is to give life to whom he will. To will implies a free nature subsisting with power to choose in the blissful exercise of omnipotence. And next, lest it should seem that to give life to whom he will is not within the power of one who has been truly born, but is only the prerogative of ingenerate omnipotence, he hastens to add, for the Father judges no man, but has given all judgment to the Son. The statement that all judgment is given teaches both his birth and his sonship, for only a nature which is altogether one with the Father's could possess all things, and a Son can possess nothing except by gift. But all judgment has been given him, for he quickens whom he will. Now we cannot suppose that judgment is taken away from the Father, although he does not exercise it, for the Son's whole power of judgment proceeds from the Father's, being a gift from him. And there is no concealment of the reason why judgment has been given to the Son, for the words which follow are, but he has given all judgment to the Son, that all men may honor the Son even as they honor the Father. He that honors not the Son honors not the Father which has sent him. What possible excuse remains for doubt, or for the irreverence of denial? The reason for the gift of judgment is that the Son may receive an honor equal to that which is paid to the Father, and thus he who dishonors the Son is guilty of dishonoring the Father also. How after this proof can we imagine 
that the nature given him by birth is different from the father's when he is the father's equal in work in power in honor in the punishment awarded to gainsayers thus this whole divine reply is nothing else than an unfolding of the mystery of his birth and the only distinction that it is right or possible to make between father and son is that the latter was born yet born in such a sense as to be one with his father. Thus the father works hitherto, and the son works. In father and son you have the names which express their nature in relation to each other. Note also that it is the divine nature, that through which God works, that is working here. And remember, lest you fall into the error of imagining that the operation of two unlike natures is here described, how it was said concerning the blind man, but that the works of God may be made manifest in him, I must work the works of him that sent me. You see that in his case the work wrought by the Son is the Father's work, and the Son's work is God's work. The remainder of the discourse which we are considering also deals with works, but my defense is at present only concerned with assigning the whole work to both, and pointing out that they are at one in their method of working, since the Son is employed upon that work which the Father does hitherto. The sanction contained in this fact that by virtue of his divine birth the Father is working with him in all that he does, will save us from supposing that the Lord of the Sabbath was doing wrong in working on the Sabbath. His sonship is not affected, for there is no confusion of his divinity with the Father's, and no negation of it. His Godhead is not affected, for his divine nature is untouched. Their unity is not affected, for no difference is revealed to sever them. And their unity is not presented in such a light as to contradict their distinct existence. First, recognize the sonship of the Son. The Son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the Father do. Here his birth is manifest, because of it he can do nothing of himself till he sees it being done. He cannot be unbegotten, because he can do nothing of himself. He has no power of initiation, and therefore he must have been born. But the fact that he can see the Father's works proves that he has the comprehension which belongs to the conscious possessor of divinity. Next, mark that he does possess this true divine nature for whatever things he does these also the son likewise and now that we have seen him endowed with the powers of that nature note how this results in unity how one nature dwells in two that all men may honor the son even as they honor the father and then lest reflection on this unity entangle you in the delusion of a solitary and self-contained God, take to heart the mystery of the faith manifested in these words, He that honors not the Son honors not the Father which has sent him. The rage and cunning of heresy may do their worst. Our position is impregnable. He is the Son, because he can do nothing of himself. He is God, because whatever the Father does, he does the same. They too are one, because he is equal in honor to the Father, and does the very same works. He is not the Father, because he is sent. So great is the wealth of mysterious truth contained in this one doctrine of the birth. It embraces his name, his nature, his power, his self-revelation, for everything conveyed to him 
in his birth must be contained in that nature from which his birth is derived. Into his nature no element of any substance different in kind from that of his author is introduced, for a nature which springs from one nature only must be entirely one with that nature which is its parent. A unity is that which, containing no discordant elements, is one in kind with itself, and unity constituted through birth cannot be solitary, for solitude can have but a single occupant, while an unity constituted through birth implies the conjunction of two. And furthermore, let his own divine words bear witness to himself. He says, They that are of my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them of my hand. That which my Father has given me is greater than all, and no man shall be able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. What lethargy can blunt so utterly the edge of our understanding as to render so precious a statement for one moment obscure to us? What proud sophistry can play such pranks with human docility as to persuade those who have learned from these words the knowledge of what God is, that they must not recognize God in him whose Godhead was here revealed to them? Heresy ought either to bring forward other gospels in support of its doctrine, or else, if our existing gospels are the only documents which teach of God, why do they not believe the lessons taught? If they are the only source of knowledge, why not draw faith as well as knowledge from them? Yet now we find that their faith is held in defiance of their knowledge, and hence it is a faith rooted not in knowledge but in sin, a faith of bold irreverence instead of reverent humility towards the truth confessedly known. God, the only begotten, as we have seen, fully assured of his own nature, reveals with the utmost precision of language the mystery of his birth. He reveals it, ineffable though it is, in such wise that we can believe and confess it, that we can understand that he was born, and believe that he has the nature of God, and is one with the Father, and one with him in such a sense that God is not alone, nor Son another name for Father, but that in very truth he is the Son. For firstly, he assures us, of the powers of his divine nature, saying of his sheep, And no man shall pluck them out of my hand. It is the utterance of conscious power, this confession of free and irresistible energy, that will allow no man to pluck his sheep from his hand. But more than this, not only has he the nature of God, but he would have us know that nature is his by birth from God. And hence he adds, That which the Father has given me is greater than all. He makes no secret of his birth from the Father. For what he received from the Father, he says, is greater than all. And he who received it, received it at his birth, not after his birth, and yet it came to him from another, for he received it. But he who received this gift from another forbids us to suppose that he himself is different in kind from that other, and does not eternally subsist with the same nature as that of him who gave the gift, by saying, No man shall be able to pluck them out of my father's hand. None can 
pluck them out of his hand, for he has received from his Father that which is greater than all things. What then means this contradictory assertion, that none can pluck them from his Father's hand? It is the Son's hand which received them from the Father, the Father's hand which gave them to the Son. In what sense is it said that what cannot be plucked from the Son's hand cannot be plucked from the Father's hand? Here, if you wish to know, I and the Father are one. The Son's hand is the Father's hand. For the divine nature does not deteriorate or cease to be the same in passing through birth, nor yet is this sameness a bar to our faith in the birth. For in that birth no alien element was admitted into his nature. And here he speaks of the Son's hand, which is the hand of the Father, that by a bodily similitude you may learn the power of the one divine nature which is in both. For the nature and the power of the Father is in the Son. And lastly, that in this mysterious truth of the birth you may discern the true and indistinguishable unity of the nature of God. The words were spoken, I and the Father are one. They were spoken that in this unity we might see neither difference nor solitude, for they are two, and yet no second nature came into being through that true birth and generation. There still remains, if I read them aright, the same desire in these maddened souls, though their opportunity for fulfilling it is lost. Their bitter hearts still cherish a longing for mischief which they can no longer hope to satisfy. The Lord is on his throne in heaven, and the furious hatred of heresy cannot drag him, as the Jews did, to the cross. But the spirit of unbelief is the same, though now it takes the form of rejecting his Godhead. They bid defiance to his words, though they cannot deny that he spoke them. They vent their hatred in blasphemy. Instead of stones, they shower abuse. If they could, they would bring him down from his throne to a second crucifixion. When the Jews were moved to wrath by novelty of Christ's teaching, we read, The Jews, therefore, took up stones to stone him. He answered them, Many good works have I showed you from the Father. For which of those works do ye stone me? The Jews answered him, For a good work we stone you not, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. I bid you, heretic, to recognize herein your own deeds, your own words. Be sure that you are their partner, for you have made their unbelief your pattern. It was at the words, I and the Father are one, that the Jews took up stones. Their godless irritation at the revelation of that saving mystery hurried them on even to an attempt to slay. There is no one whom you can stone, but is your guilt in denying him less than theirs? The will is the same, though it is frustrated by his throne in heaven. Nay, it is you that are more impious than the Jew, he lifted his stone against the body, you lift yours against the spirit. He as he thought against man, you against God. He against a sojourner on earth, you against him that sits upon the throne of majesty. He against one whom he knew not, you against him whom you confess. He against the mortal Christ, you against the judge of the universe. The Jew says, being man. You say, being a creature. You and he join in the cry, make yourself God, with the same insolence of blasphemy. You deny that he is God begotten of God. You deny that he is the son by a true birth. You deny that his words I and the Father are one, contain the assertion of one, 
and the same nature in both. But you foist upon us in his stead a modern, a strange, a alien god. You make him god of another kind from the father, or else not god at all, as not subsisting by a birth from God. The mystery contained in those words, I and the Father are one, moves you to wrath. The Jew answered, You, being a man, make yourself God. Your blasphemy is a match for his. You, being a creature, make yourself God, you say. In effect, you are not a son by birth. You are not God in truth. You are a creature, excelling all other creatures, but you were not born to be God, for I refuse to believe that the incorporeal God gave birth to your nature. You and the Father are not one, nay more, you are not the Son, you are not like God, you are not God. The Lord had his answer for the Jews, an answer that meets the case of your blasphemy even better than it meets theirs. Is it not written in the law, I said, you are gods? If therefore he called them gods unto whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, say ye of me, whom the Father has sanctified and sent into the world, that I have blasphemed, because I said I am the Son of God? If I do not the works of my Father, believe me not. But if I do and you will not believe me, believe the works, that you may know and be sure that the Father is in me, and I in him. The matter of this reply was dictated by that of the blasphemous attack upon him. The accusation was that he, being a man, made himself God. Their proof of this allegation was his own statement. I and the Father are one. He therefore sets himself to prove that the divine nature which is his by birth gives him the right to assert that he and the Father are one. He begins by exposing the absurdity as well as the insolence of such a charge as that of making himself God, though he was a man. The law had conferred the title upon holy men, the word of God, from which there is no appeal, had given its sanction to the public use of the name. What blasphemy, then, could there be in the assumption of the title of Son of God by him whom the Father had sanctified and sent into the world? The unalterable record of the word of God has confirmed the title to those to whom the law assigned it. There is an end, therefore, of the charge that he, being a man, makes himself God, when the law gives the name of gods to those who are confessedly men, and further, if other men may use this name without blasphemy, there can obviously be no blasphemy in its use by the man whom the Father has sanctified. And note here that throughout this argument he calls himself man, for the Son of God is also Son of Man, since he excels the rest, who yet are guilty of no irreverence in styling themselves gods. He excels them in that he has been hallowed to be the Son. As the blessed Paul says, who teaches us of this sanctification, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his Son, which was made of the seal of David according to the flesh, and was appointed to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of sanctification. Thus, the accusation of blasphemy on his part in making himself God falls to the ground, for the word of God has conferred this name upon many men, and he who was sanctified and sent by the Father did no more than proclaim himself the Son of God. There remains, I conceive, no possibility of doubt, but that the words, I and the Father are one, 
were spoken with regard to the nature which is his by birth. The Jews had rebuked him, because by these words he, being a man, made himself God. The course of his answer proves that in this I and the Father are one, he did profess himself the Son of God, first in name, then in nature, and lastly by birth. For I and the Father are the names of substantive beings. One is a declaration of their nature, namely, that it is essentially the same in both. Are forbids us to confound them together. Are one, while forbidding confusion, teaches that the unity of the two is the result of a birth. Now, all this truth is drawn out from that name, the Son of God, which he being sanctified by the Father bestows upon himself a name, his right to which is confirmed by his assertion, I and the Father are one. For birth cannot confer any nature upon the offspring other than that of the parent from whom that offspring is born. Once more, God the Only Begotten has summed up for us in words of his own the whole revealed mystery of the faith. When he had given his answer to the charge that he, being a man, made himself God, he determined to show that his words, I and the Father are one, are a clear and necessary conclusion, and therefore he thus pursued his argument, You say that I have blasphemed, because I said I am the Son of God. If I do not the works of the Father, believe me not. But if I do, and you will not believe me, believe the works, that you may know and be sure that the Father is in me, and I in the Father. After this, heresy that still persists in its course perpetuates a willful outrage in conscious despair. The assertion of unbelief is deliberate shamelessness. They who make it take pride in folly and are dead to the faith, for it is not ignorance, but madness to contradict this saying. The Lord had said, I and the Father are one, and the mystery of his birth, which he revealed, was the unity in nature of Father and Son. Again, when he was accused for claiming the divine nature, he justified his claim by advancing a reason, if I do not the works of the Father, believe me not. We are not to believe his assertion that he is the Son of God unless he does his Father's works. Hence, we see that his birth has given him no new or alien nature, for his doing of the Father's works is to be the reason why we must believe that he is the Son of God. What room is there here for adoption, or for leave to use the name, or for denial that he was born from the nature of God, when the proof that he is God's Son is that he does the works which belong to the Father's nature? No creature is equal or like that to God. No nature external to his is comparable in might to him. It is only the Son born from himself, whom we can, without blasphemy, liken and equal to him. Nothing outside himself can be compared to God without insult to his august majesty. If any being not born from God's self can be discovered that is like him and equal to him in power, then God, in admitting a partner to share his throne, forfeits his preeminence. No longer is God one, for a second indistinguishable from himself has arisen. On the other hand, there is no insult in making his own true son his equal. For then that which is like him is his own, that which is compared with him is born from himself. The power that can do his own works is not external to him. Nay more, 
it is an actual heightening of his glory that he has begotten omnipotence, and yet not severed that omnipotent nature from himself. The Son performs the Father's works, and on that ground demands that we should believe that he is God's Son. This is no claim of mere arrogance, for he bases it upon his works, and bids us examine them. He bears witness that these works are not his own, but his Father's. He would not have our thoughts distracted by the splendor of the deeds from the evidence for his birth. And because the Jews could not penetrate the mystery of the body which he had taken, the humanity born of Mary, and recognize the Son of God, he appeals to his deeds for confirmation of his right to the name. But if I do them, and you will not believe me, believe the works. First. He would not have them believe that he is the Son of God except on the evidence of God's works which he does. Next, if he does the works, yet seems unworthy in his bodily humility to bear the divine name, he demands that they shall believe the works. Why should the mystery of his human birth hinder our recognition of his birth as God? when he that is divinely born fulfills every divine task by the agency of that manhood which he has assumed. If we believe not the man for the work's sake, then he tells us that he is the Son of God. Let us believe the works when they, which are beyond a doubt the works of God, are manifestly wrought by the Son of God. For the Son of God possesses, in virtue of his birth, everything that is God's, and therefore the Son's work is the Father's work, because his birth has not excluded him from that nature which is his source and wherein he abides, and because he has in himself that nature to which he owes it that he exists eternally. And so the Son who does the Father's work, and demands of us that if we believe not him, at least we believe his works, is bound to tell us what the point is as to which we are to believe the works. And he does tell us in the words which follow, But if I do, and you will not believe me, believe the works that you may know and be sure that the Father is in me, and I in him. It is the same truth as is contained in I am the Son of God, and I and the Father are one. This is the nature which is his by birth, this the mystery of the saving faith, that we must not divide the unity, nor separate the nature from the birth, but must confess that the living God was in truth born from the living God. God who is life is not a being built up of various and lifeless portions. He is power, and not compact of feeble elements, light intermingled with no shades of darkness, spirit that can harmonize with no incongruities. All that is within him is one. What is spirit is light and power and life, and what is life is light and power and spirit. He who says, I am and I change not, can suffer neither change in detail nor transformation in kind, for these attributes which I have named are not attached to different portions of him, but meet and unite entirely and perfectly in the whole being of the living God. He is the living God, the eternal power of the living divine nature, and that which is born from him, according to the mysterious truth which he reveals, could not be other than living. For when he said, As the living Father has sent me, and I live through the Father, he taught that it is through the living Father that he has life in himself. And moreover, when he said, 
For as the Father has life in himself, so has he given to the Son also to have life in himself. He bore witness that life to the fullest extent is his gift from the living God. Now, if the living Son was born from the living Father, that birth took place without a new nature coming into existence. Nothing new comes into existence when the living is begotten by the living, for life was not sought out from the non-existent to receive birth, and life, which receives its birth from life, must needs because of that unity of nature and because of the mysterious event of that perfect and ineffable birth, live always in him that lives, and have the life of the living in himself. I call to mind that at the beginning of our treatise, I gave the warning that human analogies correspond imperfectly to their divine counterparts, yet that our understanding receives a real, if incomplete, enlightenment by comparing the latter with visible types. And now, I appeal to human experience in the matter of birth, whether the source of their children's being remain not within the parents. For though the lifeless and ignoble matter which sets in motion the beginnings of life pass from one parent into the other, and these retain their respective natural forces, they have brought into existence a nature one with their own, and therefore the begetter is bound up with the existence of the begotten, and the begotten receiving birth through a force transmitted yet not lost by the begetter, abides in that begetter. This may suffice as a statement of what happens in a human birth. It is inadequate as a parallel to the perfect birth of God, the only begotten, for humanity is born in weakness, and from the union of two unlike natures, and maintained in life by a combination of lifeless substances. Again, humanity does not enter at once into existence of its appointed life, and never fully lives that life, being always encumbered with a multitude of members which decay and are insensibly discarded. In God, on the other hand, the divine life is lived in the fullest sense, for God is life, and from life Nothing that is not truly living can be born, and his birth is not by way of emanation, but results from an act of power. Thus, since God's life is perfect in its intensity, and since that which is born from him is perfect in power, God has the power of giving birth, but not of suffering change. His nature is capable of increase, not of diminution, for he continues in and shares the life of that son to whom he gave birth in a nature like to and inseparable from his own. And that son, the living born from the living, is not separated by the event of his birth from the nature that begot him. Another analogy which casts some light upon the meaning of the faith is that of fire as containing fire in itself and as abiding in fire. Fire contains the brightness of light, the property of destroying by combustion the flickering inconstancy of flame. Yet all the while it is fire and in all these manifestations there is but one nature. Its weakness is that it is dependent for its existence upon inflammable matter, and that it perishes with the matter on which it has lived. A comparison with fire gives us in some measure an insight into the incomparable nature of God. It helps us to believe in the properties of God, that we find them to a certain extent present in an earthly element. I ask then whether in fire derived from fire there is any division or separation. When one flame is kindled from another, 
is the original nature cut off from the derived so as not to abide in it? Does it not rather follow on and dwell in the second flame by a kind of increase as if it were by birth? For no portion has been cut off from the nature of the first flame, and yet there is light from light. Does not the first flame live on in the second, which owes its existence, though not by division, to the first? Does not the second still dwell in the first, from which it was not cut off, from which it went forth, retaining its unity with the substance to which its nature belongs? Are not the two one? When it is physically impossible to derive light from light by division, and logically impossible to distinguish between them in nature. These illustrations, I repeat, must only be used as aids to the apprehension of the faith, not as standards of comparison for the divine majesty. Our method is that of using bodily instances as a clue to the invisible. Reverence and reason justify us in using such help which we find used in God's witness to himself, while yet we do not aspire to find a parallel to the nature of God. But the minds of simple believers have been distressed by the mad heretical objection that it is wrong to accept a doctrine concerning God which needs, in order to become intelligible, the help of bodily analogies, and therefore, in accordance with that word of our Lord which we have already cited, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, but that which is born of the spirit is spirit. We have thought it expedient, since God is spirit, to give to these comparisons a certain place in our argument. By so doing, we shall avert from God the charge that he has deceived us in using these analogies, showing as we have done, that such illustrations from the nature of his creatures enable us to grasp the meaning of God's self-revelation to us. We see how the living Son of the living Father, he who is God from God, reveals the unity of the divine nature, indissolubly one and the same, and the mystery of his birth. In these words, I and the Father are one. Because of the seeming arrogance of them engendered a prejudice against him, he made it more clear that he had spoken in the conscious possession of divinity by saying, You say that I have blasphemed because I said I am the Son of God, thus showing that the oneness of his nature with that of God was due to birth from God, and then to clench their faith in his birth by a positive assertion, and to guard them at the same time from imagining that the birth involves a difference of nature, he crowns his argument with the words, Believe the works that the Father is in me and I in the Father. Does his birth, as here revealed, display his divinity as not his by nature, and not his own by right? Each is in the other. The birth of the Son is from the Father only. No alien or unlike nature has been raised to Godhead, or subsists as God. God from God, eternally abiding, owes his Godhead to none other than God. Import, if you see your opportunity two gods into the church's faith, separate Son from Father as far as you can, consistently with the birth which you admit. Yet still the Father is in the Son, and the Son is in the Father, and this by no interchange of emanations, but by the perfect birth of the living nature. Thus you cannot add together God the Father and God the Son, and count them as two gods, for they too are one God. You cannot confuse them together, for they too are not one person. And so the apostolic faith rejects two gods, for it knows nothing of two fathers or two sons. In confessing the Father, it confesses the Son. 
It believes in the Son, in believing in the Father. For the name of the Father involves that of the Son, since without having a Son, none can be a Father. Evidence of the existence of a Son is proof that there has been a Father. For a Son cannot exist except from a Father. When we confess that God is one, we deny that he is single. For the Son is the complement of the Father, and to the Father the Son's existence is due. But birth works no change in the divine nature. Both in Father and in Son that nature is true to its kind. And the right expression for us of this unity of nature is the confession that they, being two by birth and generation, are one God, not one person. We will leave it to him to preach two gods who can preach one God without confessing the unity. He shall proclaim that God is solitary, who can deny that there are two persons, each dwelling in the other by the power of their nature and the mystery of birth given and receive. And that man may assign a different nature to each of the two, who is ignorant that the unity of father and of son is a revealed truth. Let the heretics blot out this record of the son's self-revelation, I in the Father, and the Father in me. Then, and not till then, shall they assert that there are two gods, or one god in loneliness. There is no hint of more natures than one in what we are told of their possession of the one divine nature. The truth that God is from God does not multiply God by two, the birth destroys the supposition of a lonely God, and again, because they are interdependent, they form an unity, and that they are interdependent is proved by their being one from one. For the one, in begetting the one, conferred upon him nothing that was not his own, and the one in being begotten received from the one only what belongs to the one. Thus the apostolic faith in proclaiming the Father will proclaim him as one God in the confessing the Son will confess him as one God since one and the same divine nature in both and because the Father being God and the Son being God and the one name of God expressing the nature of both. The term one God signifies the two. God from God, or God in God, does not mean that there are two gods, for God abides, one from one, eternally with the one divine nature and the one divine name, nor does God dwindle down to a single person, for one and one can never be in solitude. The Lord has not left in doubt or obscurity the teaching conveyed in this great mystery. He has not abandoned us to lose our way in dim uncertainty. Listen to him as he reveals the full knowledge of this faith to his apostles. I am the way and the truth and the life. No man comes unto the Father but through me. If you know me, you know my Father also, and from henceforth you shall know him, and have seen him. Philip says unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it suffices us. Jesus said unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and you have not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father also. How do you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I speak unto you I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwells in me and does his works. Believe me that I am 
in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe for the very works' sake. He who is the way leads us not into bypaths or trackless wastes. He who is the truth mocks us not with lies. He who is the life betrays us not into delusions which are death. He himself has chosen these winning names to indicate the methods which he has appointed for our salvation. As the way, he will guide us to the truth. The truth will establish us in the life, and therefore it is all important for us to know what is the mysterious mode which he reveals of attaining this life. No man comes to the Father but through me. The way to the Father is through the Son, and now we must inquire whether this is to be by a course of obedience to his teaching, or by faith in his Godhead. For it is conceivable that our way to the Father may be through adherence to the Son's teaching rather than through believing that the Godhead of the Father dwells in the Son. And therefore, let us in the next place seek out the true meaning of the instruction given us here. For it is not by cleaving to a preconceived opinion, but by studying the force of the words, that we shall enter into possession of this faith. The words which follow those last cited are, If you know me, you know my Father also. It is the man Jesus Christ whom they behold. How can a knowledge of him be a knowledge of the Father? For the apostles see him wearing the aspect of that human nature which belongs to him. But God is not encumbered with body and flesh, and is incognizable by those who dwell in our weak and fleshly body. The answer is given by the Lord, who asserts that under the flesh, which in a mystery he had taken, his Father's nature dwells within him. He sets the facts in their due order thus. If you know me, you know my Father also, and from henceforth you shall know him and have seen him. He makes a distinction between the time of sight and the time of knowledge. He says that from henceforth they shall know him whom they have already seen, and so shall possess from the time of this revelation onward the knowledge of that nature on which in him they long had gazed. But the novel sound of these words disturbed the Apostle Philip. A man is before their eyes. This man avows himself the Son of God, and declares that when they have known him, they will know the Father. He tells them that they have seen the Father, and that because they have seen him, they shall know him hereafter. This truth is too broad for the grasp of weak humanity. Their faith fails in the presence of these paradoxes. Christ says that the Father has been seen already and shall now be known. And this, although sight, is knowledge. He says that if the Son has now been known, the Father has been known also. And this, though the Son has imparted knowledge of himself through the bodily senses of sight and sound, while the Father's nature, different altogether from that of the visible man which they know, could not be learned from their knowledge of the nature of him whom they have seen. He has also often borne witness that no man has seen the Father. And so Philip broke forth with the loyalty and confidence of an apostle, with the request, Lord, show us the Father, and it suffices us. He was not tampering with the faith, 
it was but a mistake made in ignorance. For the Lord had said that the Father had been seen already, and henceforth should be known. But the Apostle had not understood that he had been seen. Accordingly, he did not deny that the Father had been seen, but asked to see him. He did not ask that the Father should be unveiled to his bodily gaze, but that he might have such an indication as should enlighten him concerning the Father who had been seen. For he had seen the Son under the aspect of man, but cannot understand how he could thereby have seen the Father. His adding, and it suffices us, to the prayer, Lord, show us the Father, reveals clearly that it was a mental, not a bodily vision of the Father which he desired. He did not refuse faith to the Lord's words, but asked for such enlightenment to his mind as should enable him to believe. For the fact that the Lord had spoken was conclusive evidence to the Apostle that faith was his duty. The consideration which moved him to ask that the Father might be shown was that the Son had said that he had been seen and should be known because he had been seen. There was no presumption in this prayer that he who had already been seen should now be made manifest. And therefore the Lord answered Philip thus, Have I been so long time with you, and you have not known me, Philip? He rebukes the apostle for defective knowledge of himself, for previously he had said that when he was known, the Father was known also. And what is the meaning of this complaint that for so long they had not known him? It means this, that if they had known him, they must have recognized in him the Godhead which belongs to his Father's nature, for his works were the peculiar works of God. He walked upon the waves, commanded the winds, manifestly, though none could tell how, changed the water into wine, and multiplied the loaves, put devils to flight, healed diseases, restored injured limbs, and repaired the defects of nature, forgave sins, and raised the dead to life, and all this he did while wearing flesh. And he accompanied the works with the assertion that he was the Son of God. Hence, it is that he justly complains that they did not recognize in his mysterious human birth and life the action of the nature of God performing these deeds through the manhood which he had assumed. And therefore the Lord reproached them that had not known him, though he had so long been doing these works, and answered their prayer that he would show them the Father by saying, He that has seen me has seen the Father also. He was not speaking of a bodily manifestation of perception by the eye of flesh, but by that eye of which he had once spoken, Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then comes harvest? Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white to harvest. The season of the year, the fields white to harvest, are illusions equally incompatible with an earthly and visible prospect. He was bidding them lift the eyes of their understanding to contemplate the bliss of the final harvest. And so it is with his present words. He that has seen me has seen the Father also. It was not the carnal body which he had received by birth from the Virgin that could manifest to them the image and likeness of God. The human aspect which he wore could be no aid toward the mental vision of the incorporeal God. But God was recognized in Christ by such as recognized Christ as the Son on the evidence of the powers of his divine nature, and as recognition of God the Son produces a recognition of God the Father. For the Son is 
in such a sense the image as to be one in kind with the father and yet to indicate that the father is his origin other images made of metals or colors or other materials by various arts reproduce the image of the objects which they represent yet can lifeless copies be put on a level with their living originals painted or carved or molten effigies with the nature which they imitate the son is not the image of the father after such a fashion as this he is the living image of the living the son that is born of the father has a nature in no wise different from his and because his nature is not different he possesses the power of that nature which is the same as his own the fact that he is the image proves that god the father is the author of the birth of the only begotten who is himself revealed as the likeness and image of the invisible god and hence the likeness which is joined in union with the divine nature is indelibly his because the powers of that nature are inalienably his own such is the meaning of this passage have i been so long time with you and you have not known me philip he that has seen me has seen the father also how do you say show us the father do you not believe me that i am in the father and the father is in me it is only the word of god of whom we men are enabled in our discourse concerning divine things to reason all else that belongs to the godhead is dark and difficult dangerous and obscure if any man propose to express what is known in other words than those supplied by god he must inevitably either display his own ignorance or else leave his readers minds in utter perplexity the lord when he was asked to show the father said he that has seen me has seen the father also he that would alter this is an antichrist he that would deny it is a jew he that is ignorant a pagan if we find ourselves in difficulty let us lay the fault to our own reason if god's declaration seem involved in obscurity let us assume that our want of faith is the cause these words state with precision that god is not solitary and yet that there are no differences within the divine nature for the father is seen in the son and this could be the case neither if he were a lonely being nor if he were unlike the son it is through the son that the father is seen and this mystery which the son reveals is that they are one god but not one person what other meaning can you attach to this saying of the lord's he that has seen me has seen the father also this is no case of identity the use of the conjunction also shows that the father is named in addition to the son these words the father also are incompatible with the notion of an isolated and single person no conclusion is possible but that the father was made visible through the son because they are one and are alike in nature and lest our faith in this regard should be left in any doubt the lord proceeded how do you say show us the father the father had been seen in the son how then could men be ignorant of the father what need could there be for him to be shown again the unity of begetter and begotten manifested in sameness of nature and true oneness of kind 
and proves that the Father was seen in his true nature. And this is shown by the Lord's next words, Believe ye not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me. In no other words than these which the Son has used can the fact be stated that Father and Son, being alike in nature, are inseparable. The Son, who is the way and the truth and the life, is not deceiving us by some theatrical transformation of names and aspects when he was wearing manhood, styles himself the Son of God. He is not falsely concealing the fact that he is God the Father. He is not a single person who hides his features under a mask that we may imagine that two are present. He is not a solitary being now posing as his own son and again calling himself the Father, tricking out one unchanging nature with varying names. Far removed from this is the plain honesty of the words. The Father is the Father, and the Son is the Son. But these names and the realities which they represent contain no innovation upon the divine nature, nothing inconsistent, nothing alien. For the divine nature being true to itself persists in being itself. That which is from God is God. The divine birth imports neither diminution nor difference into the Godhead. For the Son is born into and subsists with a nature that is within the divine nature and is like to it. The Father sought out no alien element to be mingled in the nature of his only begotten Son, but endowed him with all things that are his own, and this without loss to the giver. And thus the Son is not destitute of the divine nature, for being God he is from God and from no other, and he is not different from God, but is indeed nothing else than God, for that which is begotten from God is the Son and the Son only, and the divine nature, and receiving birth as a Son has not forfeited its divinity. Thus the Father is in the Son. The Son is in the Father. God is in God. And this is not by the combination of two harmonious though different kinds of being, nor by the incorporating power of an ampler substance exercised upon a lesser, for the properties of matter make it impossible that things which enclose others should also be enclosed by them. It is by the birth of living nature from living nature. The substance remains the same. Birth causes no deterioration in the divine nature. God is not born from God to be aught else than God. Herein is no innovation, no estrangement, no division. It is sin to believe that Father and Son are two gods. Sacrilege to assert that Father and Son are one solitary God. Blasphemy to deny the unity consisting in sameness of kind of God from God. Lest they whose faith conforms to the gospel should regard this mystery as something vague and obscure, the Lord has expounded it in this order. Do you not believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwells in me. He does his works. In what other words than these could or can the possession of the divine nature by the Father and Son be declared consistently with prominence for the Son's birth? When he says, The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, he neither suppresses his personality, nor denies his sonship, nor conceals the presence in himself of his Father's divine nature. 
while speaking of himself, and that he does so speak is proved by the pronoun I, he speaks as abiding in the divine substance while speaking not of himself. He bears witness to the birth which took place in him of God from God, his Father, and he is inseparable and indistinguishable in unity of nature from the Father, for he speaks, though he speaks not of himself. He who speaks, though he speak not of himself, necessarily exists inasmuch as he speaks, and inasmuch as he speaks not of himself, he makes it manifest that his words are not his own. For he has at it, but the Father that dwells in me, he does his works. That the Father dwells in the Son proves that the Father is not isolated and alone. That the Father works through the Son proves that the Son is not an alien or a stranger. There cannot be one person only, for he speaks not of himself, and conversely they cannot be separate and divided when the one speaks through the voice of the other. These words are the revelation of the mystery of their unity, and again they too are not different one from the other, seeing that by their inherent nature each is in the other, and they are one, seeing that he who speaks speaks not of himself, and he who speaks not of himself yet does speak. And then, having taught that the Father both spoke and wrought in him, the Son establishes this perfect unity as the rule of our faith. But the Father that dwells in me, he does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe for the very works' sake. The Father works in the Son, but the Son also works the works of his Father. And so, lest we should believe and say that the Father works in the Son through his own omnipotent energy, and not through the Son's possession, as his birthright of the divine nature, Christ says, Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me. What means this, believe me? Clearly it refers back to the previous, show us the Father. Their faith, that faith which had demanded that the Father should be shown, is confirmed by this command to believe. He was not satisfied with saying, he that has seen me has seen the Father also. He goes further and expands our knowledge so that we can contemplate the Father in the Son, remembering meanwhile that the Son is in the Father. Thus he would save us from the error of imagining a reciprocal emanation of one into the other by teaching that their unity in the one nature through birth given and received. The Lord would have us take him at his word, lest our hold upon the faith be shaken by his condescension in assuming humanity. If his flesh, his body, his passion, seem to make his Godhead doubtful, let us at least believe on the evidence of the works that God is in God, and God is from God, and that they are one. For by the power of their nature each is in the other. The Father loses nothing that is his because it is in the Son and the Son receives his whole sonship from the Father. Bodily natures are not created after such a fashion that they mutually contain each other or possess the perfect unity of one abiding nature. In their case, it would be impossible that an only begotten Son could exist eternally, inseparable from the true divine nature of his Father. Yet, this is the peculiar property of God, the only begotten. This, the faith revealed in the mystery of his true birth, this the work of the Spirit's power, that to be and to be in God is for Christ the same thing, and that this being in God is not the presence of one thing within another as a body inside another body but that the life and subsistence of Christ is such 
that he is within the subsisting God and within him, yet having a subsistence of his own. For each subsists in such wise as not to exist apart from the other, since they are two through birth given and received, and therefore only one divine nature exists. This is the meaning of the words, I and the Father are one, and he that has seen me has seen the Father. Also, and I in the Father and the Father in me. They tell us that the Son who is born is not different or inferior to the Father, that his possession by right of birth of the divine nature as Son of God and therefore nothing else than God is the supreme truth conveyed in the mysterious revelation of the one Godhead in Father and Son, and therefore the doctrine of the generation of the only begotten is guiltless of ditheism, for the Son of God, in being born into the Godhead, manifested in himself the nature of God, his begetter.